Hi, everybody, and welcome to uh, our next Zoom interview. Uh, today, I have with me uh, Michael Hunt, who is the bishop in the Diocese of the uh, Rio Grande, and he's been there for about a year and a half, and it's great to catch up with you, Michael. Thanks for joining us. It's great to see you and to see everybody out there. Thanks for the opportunity. It's always good to talk to you, my friend. We, uh, I've been watching the uh, Facebook, uh, your Facebook posts and some of your evening worship and I've joined you for a little bit of that. I'm always curious about what people are doing and um, I'm wondering what, as you kind of look out, you've been there long enough now to know what's normative and what's new and emerging and I am curious about some of the places where you see as you of look out doesn't have to be in your diocese necessarily it could be in somebody else's or something out in the culture that maybe even isn't church connected that you find uh you're curious about but where do you see some innovation happening some things where people are stepping out and being creative in the midst of all of this sure yeah well there there are kind of two ways that I, i'm beginning to think about the whole process of innovation during this coronavirus time and and the first the first one, of course, is is that that gospel truth that we've been talking about because it was Ascension Day yesterday, right? And right. and the whole story of all of these resurrection experiences where people didn't understand who Jesus was, and then this whole thing about him ascending into heaven. I really think there's a strong message in there for the church that uh, those of us who follow the resurrection, it's not about going back; mm. it's about going forward, you know? And, and so one of the things I'm actually seeing as an encouragement in the church is those places, those vestries, those clergy who are saying, let's lean into what the church is going to be. And, and that, you know, there's always this tension. We all want to go back. We all want to feel comfortable. But, but the part of what's guiding me in this is we need to focus on the resurrected life, which is God always saying, hey, come here where I am, right? Go meet me in go meet me in Galilee. He, did, he didn't say, hey, let's all go back where it was comfortable. Right. So, so I think we've got to lean into that. That's the first thing that, that I've got on my heart. And then the second thing is really coming out of the work that you all uh, did in laying out the three-phase approach to how we're going to get back. It occurs to me as we've been preparing the materials here for phase one and now for phase two, that phase one is where the innovation is. Mm -hmm. Phase one is, is, is what is driving the innovation. And we in the, in the Rio Grande, like everywhere else in the church, I've been shocked, quite frankly, at how quickly and how effectively almost all of our congregations adapted, you know, and, yes. and places yeah. that really, they were literally saying six months ago, we can never go online. It's too expensive. Yeah, we would, know, yeah. And then boom, yes, they did, and they did it well. So just, just thinking of those liturgical innovations that I think are exciting, uh, using Zoom as a switcher is a fascinating thing. I don't know if you've, you've seen this. Yeah, we, we, yeah, yeah. we had one of our churches that started doing it. And, uh, and so when you go on to their thing, they Zoom to Facebook Live. Yeah. They did because they wanted to have more participation of the congregation in their Sunday liturgy yes. and they yes. and so it's start you know Sunday starts the music is being played from the church but the video that you see is from somebody's driveway where they have a cross and they're processing yes. down the driveway that's the procession right yes. while you're saying then they switch to the priest who is in a different place the deacon is at home reading the gospel the preacher's in another spot and and I don't. I know Zoom was not designed to be a film studio, but but we you know we all started. I think just we're going to take what we do on Sunday, we're going to put it on screen. That's it. And so it was boring, and you know people would get up and walk to the lectern and stuff, which took forever and didn't make sense. But we're learning that you that that delivering liturgy in that screen is a different art form, and we have different tools, and so. I, I'm, I was now playing last night with the liturgy I was on with while the music was being played. I stole the camera and started doing some B-roll footage of like the candle burning or that, you know, just to try to make it more visually interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm seeing huge innovation um, with that, with our Dawson communication piece, like, like you all did, like many dioceses did. We, I've started having weekly meetings with the clergy 
that are mostly the communication out, right? That, that Tuesday is, is a time when I kind of share with the clergy what I'm thinking about. And then we've increased, we now have a monthly clericus meetings and that's the sort of they, their talk back. So we have this two-way communication going on. We have every other week, all the treasurers of the diocese get together and they literally check in and share how are they doing financially. And, um, and then in all of those things, as we started doing it, I was thinking this is an emergency thing, but as we've been doing it, I'm thinking about this is something that needs to stay. Maybe not every week talking to the clergy, yeah, but yeah. every month, like we're not gonna go back to dropping that, you know? And, and the, and so there's community and I'm seeing it at the parish level too. vestries that are reaching out with phone trees, calling all their people uh -huh. every week. And, and people saying, particularly those who have been homebound are uh -huh. saying I'm more included now than I have ever been. I am loved and cared for now more than I've ever been. And so phase one is driving this innovation. And part of what I'm now realizing as we've prepared painstakingly to phase two, materials is that phase two is like an integration phase yeah. where we're going to be trying to do the hard work of integrating the innovations that we've done with kind of what we think we remember from the face-to-face -face stuff and that's really hard work i was i was on the uh the phone with a rector of one of our larger parishes who said you know we really are going to have to work on how do we maintain the virtual ministry that we've created when we're back in our buildings? Because those yeah. two things don't really go together. Yeah. The microphones don't yeah. work. Exactly. Room, you know? and, and so I think there's the, I'm really saying to our people, stay in phase one, get good at phase one, because it's driving the innovation. And as we start thinking about phase two and then later phase three, we want to be a stronger church more engaged with our community, yes. connections with our people. We've got to figure out how to do real digital evangelism. So the, you know, all of our churches were like, oh, we're so surprised. People are joining us from other countries, from other states, you know? And so we've got to really stop and think, how do we actually include those people in our communities? Yeah. Not just, oh, now we're back in our building. So sorry, you can't visit, you can't yeah. be here. Yeah. But instead, kind of, how do you invite someone who had saw you on Facebook, how do you invite them into your Bible study? Yeah. How do you get the Zoom link for the Bible study, for the book group that just started? Because we're seeing innovation there, too. Lots of people who never would have thought of themselves as teachers yes. are now leading Zoom Bible studies, leading book groups, etc. So we've got to figure out a way to get the people that are now in our virtual orbit actually in our community. No, I think that's true. You know, we, uh, I was asked this, uh, uh, a similar question about uh, at a vestry meeting last week, which of course was happening virtually. But what it put me in mind of was a lot of our um, uh, friends who are priests in charge of rectors in uh, vacation um, communities have this really strange way of thinking about membership and their community and how they're in touch with their broader kind of snowbird community uh, during uh, the time when they're not physically present. And in some ways this has that same feel, which is how do we realize or recognize that, that the space that we're created is a space that people really can enter into and participate in. And I think, asking those kinds of questions about how do people migrate or move. You know, we, we, we're we used to thinking about how somebody moves, or at least we, we're working on it. We, we want people to move from uh, the uh, I'm online looking at where your church is to a pew, right? So as an attractional community, and, and then how do we get them to coffee, right? So like you think about, in kind of the old model of evangelism, that was the frame of community movement. And then even then, how you would get invited to participate in doing something, right? So today, we have to think of the, uh, the online community actually as a very real space in which people are entering 
into the community as if it were a salon at our church or another room in our church? And how do you move people and provide movement, uh, signage, invitation, right, for people to make their way uh, through and deeper into life and community? Absolutely. And, and we're seeing that we're seeing that in the first treasurer's meeting we had, we, you know, some of the innovation has been around stewardship. Uh, here in the Diocese of the Rio Grande, there's a real desperation with, that's, that's attached to that because yeah. a lot of yeah. our churches are really hanging by a thread and our diocese kind of is too. Uh, and so we, we quickly sort of provided a diocesan option for, for people to contribute online to every one of their churches. Right. And in the first meeting that we had with the treasurers, treasurers started reporting, we're getting donations from, from names that we don't know. So, so people are not only sort of yeah. tuning and appreciating what they're seeing online, they're, they're putting their wallet on the, on the yeah. line to say, I'm committed to this in some way, shape, or form. And, and so, so I agree. I, I'm almost wondering about, it's almost like in the old days, there was the catechumenate, you know, that kind of orbited, and then people kind of moved closer toward the center. We've talked about that in, in lots of different ways, you know, over the last 20, 30 years. Now I think our churches, because of this, have innovated to get out there into the online space. And we've got to recognize that that's a real thing. And, and yeah. so I'm wondering about innovations like uh, congregations that might decide, we really don't want to just hybrid online and in person our Sunday liturgy because that's going to be too complicated. The microphones and the cameras will get in the way of the people in the room, the people outside of the room will not have a good experience if it's built for the people in the room. So maybe, you know, you've got your eight o'clock, your Sunday school, your nine o'clock. Maybe now you've also got mm -hmm. a one o'clock online thing that is, that's purpose built, right? And maybe the, maybe there are people who would be hired to do that in multiple locations. Cause mm -hmm. one of the beautiful things about this is location doesn't matter in the same way. So right. Right. we've, we've wondered about like, could you hire a curate? And if that curate's not able to move, well, they can't work in person anyway right now. So maybe, maybe there are opportunities for digital, digital priests to offer digital worship on behalf of communities in a, in a different sort of a way. But, but the, we've needed new stewardship models and we're being forced to adopt those things. And they're gonna be bigger than the membership list, bigger than the pledging list. And, and so we got to figure out how to crowdsource the community, not just the money. Well, and to think about formation, you know, that as people are navigating the world uh, through uh, different sites, you know, how, uh, and I think this uh, uh, begs questions about formation and the way in, way in which people can engage in their own self-learning, but then how does that also then drive them to deeper participation in the community as you're saying? So what is on your page uh, where they can find information and not just about who you are as a community, but what are the things that you believe deeply in? And then, and then where, where do they go to find an inquirer's class that's run maybe in person and online at the same time, or it's only online? to enable more people to participate. Um, I was having an interesting conversation with, um, and this has been true already, but people are kind of waking up to it, which is those uh, bishops and churches that have a large presence electronically have just as much power to form, lead, and shape life in other parts of the world. And so it's just as likely that one of your parishioners might look at some of my stuff or my parishioners might look at your stuff, for instance, mm -hmm. and that they would find that as a life-giving experience that informs their localized uh, ministry and work. And so uh, it really does change and shift some of the uh, very real ground that uh, we have thought was, um, uh, for the most part, not particularly interesting. Uh, or... Um, I, I read something somewhere, I don't remember where it was, it might have been in uh, uh, Fahrenheit uh, 2000, which was a, a book uh, on future trends in church, but 
uh, there was something like, you know, baby boomers will use technology as a tool. Uh, Generation X will see it as a complement, uh, but digital natives will see it as part of their regular life. And I think part of some of what's happening about the church engaging this is uh, the new generations are um, uh, living in a world uh, where there is no division between these things. And so the, the kind of next thinking for us is how does the church become uh, a part of that world in a very real way where there's fluidity, right, uh, between those different realities, if you want, if you want. Yeah, and I'm seeing that in two ways already unfolding here. One is that